And now, please welcome up our first reader, Samantha Smith. She shone brilliantly. She was a force. And all about her was the freedom to live unhindered by the world she commanded. But there before me was the image of this woman. A Mr. Field of gold that kissed her every inch from earth to sky. Her hands raised high and her head lifted that face to see what kisses the morning clouds were giving. And I had never seen someone more free than in that moment. Holding nothing back. In awe, I was dumbfounded by what I saw, that there was such a person to be. Not subconscious or repressed, to own openly the perfection in her every mistake, that her life is defined by the journey she has taken, unafraid of what might be, should she leap into uncertainty. And I wanted to be that woman. Careless and unapologetic, cloaked naked in shamelessness, dancing jovially. Hair free and flowing curls bouncing to my beat as I dance to a song sung in my own key, the embodiment of vitality. I want to be that woman, savoring her everlasting sweetness, plateless, hands raised, head high, strong willed and colored wildflowers, catching at her dress, taking tea with butterflies, stirring the wind with her hips, calling the sun with her smile, decorated with pride, owning her own life. That female force of reckoning, unafraid to show that her veins flow green and her eyes are wide, that she's no stranger to lust and she knows her own mind, that she is bigger than your bigotry, bigger than your pettiness, bigger than the trifling things you fling callously at her wings to make her feel she is unworthy. As she rises unscathed past your inability to see that she is nothing to do with your insecurities, how I love to be that woman. Self-acknowledged beauty, poised and dignified with brown sugar for eyes and a honey-flooded smile kissing chocolate down her back and apricot thighs with the wind on her soles and bliss at her heels, a dance in every step and music in every tale. Lacing freedom through her fingers, wearing knowledge in her hair, draping courage about her shoulders and having a generous air that leads you straight into her arms because it is always safe. How I'd love to be that woman. I have found the need to be that female force of reckoning, to claim my place as free. My search, my growth will never cease, for I can see within me, in that place that hides that lady in my dreams, <laughs> I have skipped over half of my poem. <laughs> there lies eternal beauty. The fly was a type not usually seen that type of that time of year. It was a post-harvest fly, plump, juicy, and slow, very swattable. But it was not its fate to be smacked down and splattered. No, it was destined for a more dignified demise. The spider, having divined from the seismic buzz that a bumbling beast was afoot, having done the math, it engineered a trap to bait, snare, subdue, sedate, secure, and preserve the fly. The cat held the fly in contempt, but the spider it respected. Something about that red hourglass had a soothing effect. The fly made a pass or two, but could not resist the bait. That dangling sack of <laughs> rimmed with sticky silk, engineered so as to lull the fly into a self-activated straitjacket, allowing wiggle room enough to constrict the drawstring, restricting the degrees of freedom re required to exit stage right. The cat was impressed. 
The spider rappelled down to eye level within striking distance, did a victory dance, and scurried back up to admire its handiwork. The cat was not amused. Thank you. My next piece. My next piece is called um, Just Desserts. When the shade offers but token shelter, when immersed in the throes of a midsummer swelter, when things best served cold are best belated until the rusted edge is jaggedly serrated, when the task at hand is a thirst to quench, when what's on tap is spiked with a tinge, when bygones can't be left alone, when the thirst is to avenge. Such methodical meditation, so delectable a treat, such meticulous incubate, incubation, so delicious, so dreadful, so sweet. Such a fitting tit for tat with my mind, the option flirts, but I'll leave it to poetic justice to serve such just desserts. Thank you. Next up, please welcome Aaron Kane. This piece is a little more planned than most of my stuff is. Those of you who know me will know what I'm talking about. It's called Clean Slate. Free my fire, fight my fate. My heart was blank and empty. I was a child by the edge of the pond, lost in the rushes, cattails, and the voices of frogs. My elbows were skinned, my knees muddy, in the joyful plague of the always slain in winter. This is my story. The tale of tadpoles wriggling to free themselves from childish but careful hands. I always knew I would let them go, but it's a fact that they didn't. I was barely seen in my enormity. A vague and menacing shadow splashed upon the shallows, my laugh an iron bell in some cathedral of the sky. Wide eyes and a mouth big enough to swallow pride or cause death with a whisper. Destiny is being powerless. Youth is fire and fate, his hands outstretched and wanting, is never forgetting that somehow they forgot you long enough to let you go, and you survived, got bigger, took time and rode him like a fiery steed until you reached the top of some craggy winding trail and looked back, pausing in the way that mortals have, those doomed to die are forever wondering where they've been trying to take that single step back to where the pond meets the rushes and everything begins one way or the other and the sky is still limitless, a world unexplored and rarely ever thought of except as blue and always there and winter is creeping closer and we know that. The one thing we never forget is ice and fire which are the same in all ways but one. Winter is the backward face of spring but mud is always safe though people, like angels, are always flying away through rainstorms and tempests aiming for the blue of the empty sky home is where the heart is home is the hangman and nothing was ever so difficult as being there when everything is ending remembering beginnings steps forward can never be taken back a day lived is a gift that leaves tiny parts of itself in tiny places but is never whole once broken having swallowed everything and being cold dark and alone. The frog returns to the pond, the man to the hollow stalks of dead cattails. Sunk in the mud once again, one reaches for the other, remembering everything that has passed between them, all the roads they have traveled since last they met. And the end isn't ending, it's knowing. Trespassing Stoplights and Attitudes by Mary McGrath. Downtown at 7th and Olive, our sweaters sharing seams. To violate eyes along the way, I parked your palm inside my own. To gather interest from a drunk falling into his filth. Bottle your courage, sweetheart, before it's diluted with stares from a street gang throwing slander at your thighs. 
protected by my hand and yours. Speaking of love poems, there's a little one I wrote. Still here. The absence of presence at the center of love makes feeling an empty space filled by the warmth of sex. Tantalizing the nature of reality, a nothingness, stimulated by a rush of energy between thighs to the stomach, up through the throat, resting on the tongue, before rushing up and down the spine, again and again. Held captive, willing, the gaze of lovers, eye, mind, and soul, is steady and contemplative. No abstraction can be made about the intense memory of two strangers in passing. Imagination can be pushed so deep that lines appear and shapes erect in the shadows of absence. The self is lost to anticipation. Dream is the only perfect union. Six months apart and one day together, our souls speak in tongues, licking lips and groins through memory and bettering ourselves for happiness. My passion rams against the refusal of your tears. Parting breaks the skin. give an intro or a context, but since this is last week's week, we're doing four minutes. This is a good time for it, I guess. So I'm going to keep my intro short. I'm going to give you a hint. My father's name is Paul. He writes me a lot of emails, and I took a lot of poetic justice in putting this together, but he certainly had a hand over the past couple years, so this is Paul. The pressure to misuse will become immense. Our recipes leave a lasting impression. Many people waste enormous time and energy attempting to be something. <laughs> DARPA insects and those Amazon.com birds. <laughs> I'm sure you know it, but it bears repeating. It's changing in ways that will have a profound effect on our quality. I live somewhat vicariously through you. We're at the end of something immense and wonderful. You'll see that in hindsight. The picture will change. Hard to believe I got through that bull in one piece smiling. It affects you in ways not yet known. In any case, you're my baby. I just reread it. It's really a love letter. It chokes me up. The murkiness mostly goes away, so it'll be 99.5% good and 5% murky, and that's the best it gets. I'm here. Environmental viciousness and absurdity levels are directly correlated. You're exactly the same age today as I was when my father died. I still ask him for advice sometimes. Turns out he would have used a softer touch, a kinder word. There's no book for this, I'm just guessing. Eating fresh Dungeness crab outside of Fisherman's Wharf till I burst. Guess that should be last on the bucket list. This is important. Funds are at a premium. I once flew over a volcano spewing gas and fumes in the South China Sea. Pictures are buried somewhere. Every time I look at that post-it, I think I do. I was there. This affords me no special privileges or rights, but it does connect us. We can't trample the kindergarten rules. This applies to everyone, not just you. It flushes the crap out of your kidneys. <laughs> You're beating yourself up for no reason that I can discern. Nobody listens to me. I suspect we're both on the men this weekend. Stay near the center. I'll be right out. You'll want to remember your face. I didn't break it. There's no bone there to break. I won't need the life after death sauce after all. Never push the knife sideways. It takes a butcher's hand. Time is short. I hope that eases your mind somewhat. Next up, please welcome Snowy.
Okay, so this is my first time up here. And my first time reading in front of an audience bigger than one. So here we go. All right, this one is called Patience. Ladybug, crawling on your sleeve, I turn to you and say, it's God. Sitting in the basement, surrounded by a warm circle of desperate people, grateful for their sobriety. We place her back on the chair in front of you, but that persistent little creature flies back onto your lap over and over, patiently waiting for your resignation and acceptance. And this is the other one. Um, it's called The Reflector. I am the light shiner. My costume is made of broken mirrors. Men come to me in disrepair, unsure of their substance, adrift and insecure. I hold up my mirrors and reflect into their potential, show the world their character, and kindle the glow that dances behind their eyes until they stand in their shoes, gaze onto the horizon, and declare themselves free. Some give a nod and some a thank you as they walk ahead, steady and sure. I am the light shiner. My costume is made of broken mirrors. I'm left to my solitary delusions as day sinks away, siphoning milk from the moon, waiting for the next broken shadow to cross my path and fall in love with his reflection in my mirror and leave renewed. That's it. Please welcome up Emily. Saturday in Springfield, and it's called Poetry Undressed, so it was erotic po poetry. <laughs> and I woke up on Saturday morning like I didn't write anything ahead of time. <laughs> well, my stuff is about death, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so, so I just kinda had fun writing this quickly, I hope you enjoy it. It's called Safe Word. <laughs> I've been thinking about how you really know what you're doing, and so do I, and how together we really got it right. Like, I don't even have to ask to have my hair grabbed, my left, my neck choked, my body stroked, and that's amazing. I hate when sex is flavorless, but it gets kind of dangerous playing around like this, so we definitely need to have a safety word. Something simple, something sinful, I just can't figure out what, because Kevin Hart said pineapples is his safe word, and Rick Ross said diced pineapples make your f***ing taste good, but I'm confused as to how that should even taste. Like, if you want a fruit smoothie, go to Orange Julius. If you want to something else, call me, but anyways. Maybe a safety word should be something crazy, like sassafras, but nah, that would just make me laugh. How about something we couldn't mix up, like build me up buttercup, you never call me that soft stuff. I'm not even trying to get cuffed, I just miss it when you're so caught up trying to hit it, like I'm getting off subject, Shit. You got me running in circles, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Well, I was thinking maybe our safe word should be something like, get the off me, I'm exhausted, but that's a mouthful. I won't say a mouthful of what, because you already know. God damn, I'm getting distracted from the problem at hand, a handful of, you already know, but I digress. We're not making any progress here. I'm wondering what combination of letters could stone cold stop the measure of pleasure when we come together? What word would catch your attention to offer me protection like I even need it? With chest heaving, pulse beating, scratches bleeding, I would ever want you to stop. You could bruise my whole body and I'd still keep coming for you, I know. That fear of being needed keeps you cut off from emotion like poison, but let it go for a moment because I think I thought of the perfect word. Four letters. Each of them like barbed wire to your ears. Four letters leave a taste like copper in your teeth. The next time our limbs are entangled, your shoulders on my ankles, moments away from being dismantled. Next time we're f***ing and it becomes too much to handle. If you hear me say I love you, you know to stop. <laughs> Uh, my duet partner and I in our belly dance show, or we're doing a duet for the show, and we're super, super nervous, so our safe word is pickle, and then we're gonna throw our veils over our heads and run off the stage and leave. I think that we're kidding when we joke about that when we're rehearsing. Anyways, next up, please welcome one of the sweetest men I know, Tim Gillis. Yeah. 
we do even have to follow that. That was spectacular. Um, I was going to do something erotic as well, but I'll hold on. Honestly, that was freaking beautiful. Safe word, that is good stuff. <laughs> So this is, um, this is the text from one of my books. I've never actually read this aloud. Uh, so, and by the way, are, are, there, this is a, are there any parents here? Does anyone have kids? There's like three, right? Okay, this is one of those heartfelt parent things, so it's gonna be crickets out there going, what the f is he talking about? I understand pineapple, but what is he talking about? <laughs> right, so for you three parents, see if this works at all. All right. Once, I was a giant. Once my hands were so big, they could hold both of yours. I was taller than the trees and the mountains once, and, and I was stronger than the wind. Once I could laugh, and the whole world would laugh with me, or cry, and the world Once my arms were so strong they could raise you up to the stars or bring you back home, wrap you up and protect you from the night. Once I was the wisest man in the world, able to answer any of your questions. Now, now I sit and watch as you grow so big, so strong, so wise, and I smile. Thankful for the gift you have given me. Because I was a giant once. Okay, so next up, I'm going to call someone from the wait list. So that's your cue, people on the wait list, to get your stuff together. While I plug our feature for tonight, who is Steve Sabrizi. He is amazing. He giggles like no one I've ever met. He's also an awesome poet. Awesome musician, he'll tell you all about that. Please welcome up Ramona. songs for a lady, now all I hear are sweet goodbyes. I am Tomato, and it was only after you left that I found out that you never really liked tomatoes, specifically the squishy part on the inside, and I am a squishy tomato. <laughs> by that I mean I'm squishy. I'm in love with love, for you by way of poetry and love. 
definitely the love. And all things to you, the way you left the counter full of crumbs and used up all the spoons, the naughty galoshes blowing air kisses and woos from room to room. And I wonder how I'll move on. You're shouting to let you go. My friends say let you go, but my therapist hears no. This is overwhelming. But I owe it to myself because I am still a tomato. I'm a cheap beer art party, and when I say cheap beer, I don't mean that hipster shit that tastes like somebody already puked in it. I mean that kind of beer that comes in 15 packs, though they call it 12, three for free, and it's from Canada, and there's no known alcohol content, and it's eight dollars, and no one knows they're drunk, and no one remember the shit in the morning, but the art will. And if you think I'm going to name it, you have missed the point, because I am a potluck waiting to happen for the sake of deep conversations about awkward topics, and to show you my sweet cooking skills. Until the fourth time around when you find out I've run out of love. That's all I have, that's all the love I have because that's all she taught me to make. That's all the love I have because anything, especially Survivor Kitchen, tastes better when it's made with love. And we did it with love. And when we were in our underwear, and when we danced in between ingredients and stirring, I miss you. I miss cuddling as hard as possible and laughing even harder, laughing at each other's laughing until you snort and we laughed even harder, completely naked and wonderfully vulnerable and all day long and until it rains, until we excuse the misproductivity and the dirty dishes and the stress of out there, the place where you could hear love in the silence, the size of good loving, slowly and with attention to detail where I found out that I could die. I knew that if that was it, that I was happy. And for the first time in my life, I miss feeling home. I miss feeling loved. I miss having a family that I don't have to beg to show up. You showed up. Even if it was just you, me, and the cats, I miss mentioning your name without the cats wailing in heartache. I miss being Little Spoon. I am still a tomato. And I'm a manipulative son of a But I'll apologize for it right after it happens because I don't know I'm doing it and I'm really good at it. And I'm a compulsive liar for the sake of storytelling, but never in my poetry and never to you. I picked my nose for the sake of breathing, and I did my best never to fart in front of you, even though you could convince our bed hog kitties to leave the room in disgust in the middle of the night, sound asleep you were. I love you. I love you. I love you for being an inconvenient tomato. The mixed CD said ketchup. So where did you go, my love? Off to learn the world in skin so fragile, my words bruise even the thought of you. No. So missed connection returned to sender, so a better invitation was composed for your eyes and hands only, dear you and I verse. Please. This is a sad song most men are afraid to write. I am afraid. I am scared of a world that left me to sit and cry alone, no friends that would hold me, no one who believes me, this wolf cries, though you called me bear, these tears are real, though all you saw was my last efforts to keep a great wall from falling. With nothing but stamps and love notes, I bought you sorry, the first game I was willing to play, and I meant it. Are we really through, my love? Does it have to be this way? And will I ever write without tears smearing ink, walls made of straw, my love, the match that set us ablaze? This is me. This is who I am, the man you fell in love with, the heart that holds whole bodies in breath, where we kept myself beneath your ribs. It was too much. You lost your breath, breathed me back out, while all I wanted to do was hold you. I miss you. I miss your arms and legs structuring the no words and edgewise, the way we held like no one else. The love that was never the issue except for myself. Until you told me I do not love you. I broke. I have nothing left to fight with. You win. And we lost. I am happy you are still happy. That the stories of your smile reached me through Luna Dogs and Dreams. The last attempts at holding on, the snow-covered trees where we left our sense of ever after, where the universe took you back, where my foundation fell, left to mark the trail so that you could find me one day, forest of boxes, packed our family inside, then unpacked so you could take your half, 
So I locked it all away until, along with my longing, I'm scared to open our home in a house without you, where the cats will smell you on slippers and welcome mats. I lost everything. My hope is that I still hope. That there's a home that feels like home, where our love echoes in the little things, where this world sees me smile again, where I don't have to be so serious, where Nicholas does not cry when word of you is spoke, because I speak of you every night I tuck him in. When he lights up as he did with only you, the way we squished together and made tomato soup. I am, and are you aware of what you left on the stove? And can you still smell me in the water as it pulls you out and blows you back, sand beneath your toes on a beach where perfect existed in photographs that weren't so perfect? You exhaled, then dove into me. Goodbye, tomato. I will always love you. since that day, we went our separate ways. And these puddles, these puddles are filled with precious ailments that clog my incoherent well-being, stripping my present from right before me. I go through my day brushing off these thoughts as if they were insults and rumors. I just wish all this would have happened a little sooner. I just guess that there's never a good time to say goodbye. No, what I'm saying is that I never wanted to say goodbye. I mean, I did, but everything's so f up. It's like this innocent love of ours all of a sudden moseyed into the depths of hell, committed every single sin, and came back to tell everyone. Because now, it seems like the whole world knows what happened. Now all I have are these memories. Memories that drive me crazy. Memories that make me love you all over again. Memories that take strolls through my thought every 10 minutes, it seems. I look at you and say, what has gone so damn wrong? The only thing that holds my hand now are this lighter and this bomb. I can't comprehend, girl, how you got in that blouse. I don't know what life will be without you, but I guess I'm about to find out. Next up, please welcome Mr. Bob Lipton. Since this is the last night, we'll have four minutes. I thought you might enjoy the first two chapters of my novel in progress. Fine. <laughs> this is called A Poem to My Contemporaries, of Whom I Am But Little Aware. People, hey! I know you are out there, that there are quite a lot of you, millions upon millions and even billions of you, depending on how exactly one means the word contemporaries. Anyway, suffice it to say that too few of you with whom I share this ride on our awful and pleasant planet am I in fact personally in touch with. And yes, yes, I do wish it were otherwise, but sadly, I am not so sociable. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted you to know I was thinking of you. <laughs> and if anyone has a uh, suggestion for a better title for this, I may listen. I call it electronic. You, little lady, are my it girl. And even though I'm not the IT guy, no way at all techno savvy, 
I do know I have got to interface with you interlip, intertongue, interbody, intersoul, my hardware, your software. Oh, please, baby, do plug me in. Our last person from the wait list is a very special person. He has been serving you alcohol all evening and looking beautiful while doing it. Please welcome up Devin. Around TV, I had to go. Shout out to the TV. Uh, also, a shout out to Craig. Can we give it up one time for Craig? Uh, Craig, give it up one time for Craig. One time for Craig. Because this man comes here every Tuesday at 6.30. He, Craig doesn't get anything except awesome poetry, and I think that's what he's after. And he allows this to happen every week, and it allows people like Christian to come up here and kill it, and that's what you did, and that was rad. Um, so, thank you, Craig. Right. I'm going to do two. First one's short. I didn't know I had to mention it was expression. I thought it was understood. So when the uniforms came, I just yelled. I rearranged and became what I felt. Nothing. Everything was white, except the bars. Those black, with no end. This next one I did a couple weeks ago, I forgot an entire stanza, so I'm gonna do it again, because I have to do it right. So here we go. I always have the worst sleep on Tuesdays, because inevitably some of these words make their way to the ceiling and through the floorboards of which I sleep on, only to find themselves trapped between the same two ears that have heard it all a thousand times before but never listened until Tuesdays. So I always have the worst sleep on Tuesdays. See, what we do here stays here, and here is everywhere we've ever been. So sometimes when here's empty, I bring my beanbag chair down from the upstairs. I park it right here on this stage and simultaneously breathe. The two things that help most, weed and poetry. What a feeling. And on that exhale, even the moon tries to find some little bit of something someone might have left behind as it uses my waves of smoke as its lines. I really hope it knows to read between them. This energy's a demon, one that cannot be destroyed or created or employed or held down and enjoyed like we can be, but we're made of it. So evidently shining through and out of every eye I've ever laid mine on and ever will. And I was told once lies of ropes that hang folks from their insides. So when I look up at these rafters after all these loops have been tied, I see half this room just dangling. And I wonder where the truth went. Thank you. She tells me one thing at a time. She believes that every story gets the ending it deserves. She has to. Underneath her pitch perfect facade, she is as much romantic as anyone I know. She prefers Beatrice to Ophelia and comedies 
to tragedies. He tells me he's a transcendentalist, but I fear realism has crept its way closer. F realism, I yell in the middle of one night. I want to live in a tiny house in the woods. The rose said, seek the path, and Emerson said the answers are inside, but Crane painted us pictures nobody wanted to see. I want everything at once, and I want to trust my intuition. I don't want to be sensible and real anymore. I want to follow Alice into Wonderland. I want, I want, I want to crawl into my books. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. I want a Gatsby ending. I mean, not the part where Nick is disenchanted. Or Gatsby is floating face down in the pool. But that hope part, I'll take that. So I had a sad poem that I was going to read tonight, because I have a lot of those. But I think that this night calls for a hopeful one, and I don't really have any new hopeful poems. It's something I'm working on very hard. <laughs> so you all have heard this, but it's, it's one of my, my favorites. Hey Jude. A letter to my soulmate, or Matthew McConaughey, whoever I meet first. <laughs> when we meet, my hair will be tangled, my knees skinned, my glasses crooked. I may seem small, but do not let these things deter you. On our first date, you'll ask me about my favorite music. I'll tell you how there's a Beatles song for every person and event in my life, how here comes the sun as I saved myself, and hey Jude is my call to my soulmate. You'll ask what you will be, and I'll say, I don't know yet. You'll say, okay, just as long as I'm not mean, Mr. Mustard, I will not tell you then, but I will already know when we are 40, You'll say you don't want me to be your girlfriend anymore. And I will walk towards you barefoot in the mud, in the middle of a firefly field, a single flower in my hair, and I will tell you you were nothing I expected. And everything I wanted. You will tell me I am the clumsiest woman you have ever known, and that you love every second that we have together. I will promise to learn how to make your favorite coffee, and you will promise to want me forever. I'll do your laundry every week, and your pillowcase will always smell like me. I will put not only one, but two stripper poles in our bedroom. <laughs> some mornings, I'll put chocolate kisses in your jacket pockets before you go to work, and some days, they will melt and make a huge mess, but you won't even care because you'll think it's that adorable. When we are 85, you'll read your favorite book every night. While I put on my acne medication, as I am certain, I will still have acne then. <laughs> and then we will undress and lie in bed together and still be naked together because I will be your woman, and you will be my man, and our skin, old as it is, will still be warm when we are braided limbs together. I will know every line. Granted, I will have put most of them there, and we will be hot Eskimo kisses all through the night when we meet. You'll find that I say okie dokie a lot. That I am always, you know, this is the first time I've ever dropped this. When we meet, you'll find that I say okie dokie a lot. That I am always running late with an, an obscure Star Trek t reference on the tip of my tongue and that I drop everything, including poems. <laughs> I may seem small, but do not let these things deter you, because I am going to love you with every ounce of this little heart I have, bigger than a farmer's loom. Read 
read uh, Devon inspired me uh, in particular, but uh, good listening crowd tonight. I wish I had more time for 60s movies where white directors treat color like they invented color. You ever watch Satyricon? You ever watch two hours of a film without understanding a sim single aspect of it? <laughs> Except that Italian boys are uncomfortably beautiful <laughs> and hermaphrodites are our good luck. Good to know what's going on. And when it's over, meaning was an inch away that whole time. And how much damage can be done in an inch? Ask Bruce Lee's fist. I wish I had more time for 60s movies. Time to ponder them at dive bars while eyeballing that guy in the corner. Until he growls, what? And I growl back, Fellini. I wish I had more time to read I started reading this year. No, really reading. Like when Hamlet's head is larger than the play. Like a winking sky. Like the whole of the globe's roof. Like Hamlet is several steps ahead of me, hundreds of years behind. I want more time just to read Hamlet and read it again. And with more time still, I'd try my hand at sea shanties. I'd be the guy who sings sea shanties. The guy warbling around, muttering my kingdom for a sight of the sea, and to have a kingdom too. And more time to wield a claymore sword and defend a portcullis. I want to wield a claymore sword and defend a portcullis. My honor burning like Joan of Arc under life's interrogation lights, an extrovert reflecting mirrors in a world of milk toast. More time to write and reflect and be published in plowshares and say, oh, that rag. <laughs> and with more time still, more extensions of me from golf clubs to children, more stretches of me, more things from my hand, more flowers, more will she, won't she. Will she, won't she, and folded up notes in Red Rover games. Will she, won't she, our breaths making one fog on New Year's nights. Will she, won't she, down on my knee. Will she, won't she, on my deathbed with tubes for lungs. Will she, won't she, I hope she will. And if God is a woman, I hope she will. And if God is unknowable, I hope I will. And if God is not there, I'd know that too. And with more time still, I'd hold the tree's hand. And for years, I would try to explain how to hold the tree's hand. Never succeed. I, I just never quite manage. Would anyone like to come watch a movie? I have everything by Fellini. I like what he does with color. That's long enough to get a beer from Devin and tip him handsomely because he is handsome. Go out, smoke half the cigarette, not the whole thing. I'm not endorsing smoking, but now's your time to do it if you need to. And then come back, and we're going to all listen to Steve Spreezy as he melts us. And he has merch, so you can peruse that to get a preview for your feature. Five minutes. Hello, everybody. Let's start moving up. There are some seats here close to the front. Steve is a very fine young fellow. You want a nice close view of him? Come, come mosey closer. As I tell you about our amazing feature who's going to be coming next week, Nina Palisano. Yeah. Yes. Nina is 
absolutely breathtaking and haunting and beautiful. She's currently doing her Div 3 at Hampshire College. She's going to be your feature for next week. It's going to be amazing not to be missed. Now that we have started moseying, continue, get your tushy in a seat because Steve is going to be coming up. Steve Sabrizi, as I mentioned before, the man with the best giggle I have ever heard. See, he's doing it now. I know, that's what happens when people say they're gonna tickle me. I start laughing because they said they're gonna tickle me. He has a book, it's called A Thousand Flies. He drew the little flies, they're dots. He used a stencil, it's very exciting. Steve, Steve is an amazing poet. <laughs> amazing poet. He put together these books. They're brand new. Uh, he wants to share them with you. His poetry is as heartfelt as it is funny. He brings so much truth out and just has such a knack for observation. It's truly wonderful to listen to. Please welcome up Steve Sabrizi. Thanks so much, Christina. That was so sweet. some words. <clears throat> Here am I, half asleep in this cave that I found, feeding from a crate of corgini, a fruit that fell out of fashion. Who am I to complain about the shape of the walls, the stalactites, that remind me of dildos long since gone? Or how no one can hear me scream when the echoes surround me like a sound system and make me feel rich? It feels good to quit a job. The world's smartest person is an idiot. These are sayings that I plan to put on my new walls, along with the images of zebras and meerkats that I have, all looking off to one side, peacefully confused. <laughs> the world's loneliest mammal is the land whale. Nobody has ever seen a land whale, not even another land whale. The land whale spends its entire lifetime seeking out puddles for drinking and bathing. I am grateful for my cave. In the far left corner of my cave, there is a machine that can tell the mountains all about me. Nowadays, avalanches are always interrupting other avalanches. I have a joke that I would like to share, but the echoes make me feel embarrassed. I am probably a monster. I usually feel quiet and small, but I have breathed fire into the cold, stale air. An angry mob wears tight jeans and nose rings in my dreams. They knock a heavy heartbeat on my door. I, uh, I had a PowerPoint that I prepared with that, but um, there's no projector. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I had to break the weird seal. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> the metal detector costs a merciful $15 at a yard sale in Marblehead. You can always find much more abandoned food on the beach than anything that glitters but in detecting, at least there is something like dignity. In the long hours that it takes to earn a keep, the act becomes many things. Golfing in reverse, pacing an evil king's maze, 
a dizzy parade through the wrong state. On a boon day, you can spare enough to buy a steak wrap and a bottle of lemonade, and you can sit on the rock wall by the tide, your mouth rich with mayonnaise, and stare at the seagulls, who stare wildly at nothing, and then fly out to nowhere. So, thank you. It's, uh, it's springtime, despite all evidence to the contrary. The bushes are flush with business cards. The children are having a yard sale in 40 Point Helvetica. Hear the birds linking to their fan pages while the breeze tugs, hoops, angles toward a sponsorship with a popular new brewery. My band is playing a show at this bar in Alston on Tuesday. It would be cool to see you. Check out the clouds. Each one plastered into an odd shape. Must be part of some high concept viral marketing campaign. We might get rain soon. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you out here in the western part of the state uh, heard about this or, or are as affected as we were, but um, uh, the, the Feng Hua bus uh, <laughs> shut down, uh, was shut down by the federal government. I did not mean that to be a mislead. That would not have been uh, a joke that I would have made. <sighs> a, a few weeks ago, the Feng Hua bus uh, company was shut down by the federal government, and I found out about that. Uh, at South Station on my way to New York City. So I was one of the last fools to say, oh, I'll just fung wide. <laughs> um, so anyway, this, but I felt really sad about this, this bus, seriously sad, because, you know, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, you had a cheap ride, um, and it's gone forever, and when anything is gone forever, it can be at least a little sad. Anyway, this is my, Elegy for the Feng Wan bus. The shortest distance between two beasts is always a mad beast. If haste equals need times fire, and panic is the root of all motion, then any axle that holds a wheel to a wheel for three hours is solid as gold, a fungible commodity. If waste is the future noun of rest, then what does a passenger do besides catch colds and ash? What traveler is not at least one way an accident? Some of us have caused deaths. Most of us have injured a dependent. The best of us are imminent hazards. When a magnificent wind dies, a train will come for the priority ticket holders where a train is the shortest distance between two questions. If a city is a question and, a, and danger is its quickest answer, then the bus is in flames by the food court, and the train has derailed in New Haven, and the plane is a story like a volcano, and all tickets departing will be oversold. There is no good way to leave, no such beast. The affordable wind blew fast and blew out, and we who sit low and wait are not Feng Wa's. In that, we are small and soft, and still elude the law. <clears throat> so um, my good friend Emily O'Neill is putting together, some of you know Emily O'Neill, some of you don't, that's all right. Um, she's putting together a, uh, a, a zine project on the subject of teen angst. I think she's just calling it teen angst. So um, if you have poems that you uh, want to write about teen angst um, or have already, um, and you want to get, uh, you want to send them to Emily O'Neill, you probably should. Um, this is the one that I wrote, um, and it is called Driving in the Dream Cars of Fairfield County, Connecticut. We lived in rival McMansions and bought the cafeteria food until we could drive, and then we drove to the Duchess. 
We loaded up on fried meat. Cloves were lit. We believed deeply in Buicks and the moon for no reason as yet satisfyingly explained outside of nightly radio programs. We hated all radio. We burned <laughs> CDs full of songs that had been brief hits two decades ago. I had taken dozens of weeks of moons of rides in your car before I learned that I had only ever read about you in serialized books. I then performed an elaborate exorcism that involved my gold Hyundai, which I later allowed my dad to sell off so that he could finish purchasing that tableau of recreation that he had been dreaming about. My dad works on guitars. He used to use them to play his own songs. <clears throat> and that's how I feel about the suburbs. I grew up in them. Um, <laughs> So, uh, let's see, okay, this poem does not have an introduction. <laughs> <All right. clears> you are the life of the wedding, you beginner of dances that mimic real-life movements, those from the marketplace or the doctor's office. As we join in this circle to celebrate a love being passed into law, you go first to shout that love into noise, out into the chill barn air. You, who wear a cardigan, or a bolo tie, or a, a blazer of cheap paisley brazen with shoulder pads. You, who do not wear your fear of the future. As the bass beat of our people's choreography startles away the night birds, you may find me lock kneed dumb, dressed as a carefree person who could drift unthinking into hotels. You brisk slap to the biceps of serious relatives. You sibling to the lion-faced and the librarian-voiced alike. You who might say, delicious, or oh you, oh you, <laughs> whose real life movements shake hinges loose. If we dance tonight, you are going to have to lead like one would lead a sheep, freshly shorn, to the far side of a long, cool pasture. And it, uh, shoot, I lost my place. Okay. Long, cool pasture. And if you find me on some future night, please find me in the window of a pizza parlor, eating a large slice of pizza out of the box, reading a new book in my own booth. Thanks. I wrote that poem uh, after I went to a wedding. Duh. Um, this poem goes out to my friend Steve Gray, uh, who uh, used to have the job that I still have. Um, and uh, the, the job that I have, I guess I should tell you, is I work as a door person at a bar and music venue. Um, and uh, the, the music venue uh, books a lot of country and folk sort of acts, so this poem is named for a lyric from a song popularized by Skeeter Davis. If you don't know it, it's not going to really matter. Um, but the poem is called, Everything's the Same as It Was. The apocalypse is the world's safest object of unrequited love. One day, lo, it will come, although you may wait for years tucked inside of the earth. Oh, lead singer on the club's slowest night, with your effects pedals strewn like the hearts of plastic foes, ride a bus with me to a sea or an ocean, to the end of land, where we may stare at water leaving us while stuck behind the lenses of various intoxicants. This basement club is no good. It would have us for members. Its patrons have stolen most of the electric candles and the bathroom graffiti undermines a lot of the MC sentiments. <laughs> I have wiped the tables rid of the tall forgotten beers and flipped the stools and restocked the lost and found. You 
have gone home. Once more, the bar is the last slid chord of the country song it was built to resemble. The bartenders left, left some after work beers in the walk-in fridge where it smells like everything together and everything together equals garbage. <laughs> gotten all personable and goofy with you, I'm gonna get super serious for a second. Um, not well-timed, but okay. Um, so, I'm coming here from Cambridge, Massachusetts, as a lot of you know, um, and uh, it would probably be really uh, strange of me not to say something about what just happened in my hometown. I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, I don't really feel like talking about it. I don't think it's really necessary, but uh, I do want to read this one piece, and I think if I just read it without uh, saying anything beforehand, you might get the impression that I'm one of these people who's running around right now uh, freaking out about the police state and uh, making that the main thing that I say. And uh, while I am generally concerned about uh, the police and don't generally trust them any more than I trust anybody else with guns or bombs, that's not really what I'm feeling right now. I do. Uh, I'm also pretty grateful uh, for the manhunt, such as it was. Uh, and I'm just, <sighs> despite whatever implications there are, I am just glad that we're uh, at least. I don't think that anyone is ever safe. Uh, I don't think that that's part of being immortal. But, but um, anyway, uh, I just, the caveat that I want to deliver before I read this poem, and this is already more words than I wanted to say before the poem, uh, but. The thesis of this piece, as is the thesis of every poem that I write and every poem that I like, is uh, something uh, that can basically be boiled down to, it's complicated. Um, I think that that's what most smart words mean. Uh, or words that attempt to be smart. Anyway, um, so having said all of that, um, this, uh, this is a piece that I wrote during the height of the Occupy movement, and it is called Black Block. And if you don't know what a black block is, uh, look it up. It doesn't really make enough of a difference for me to get into. <clears throat> black block. Worse than the power outage that... Uh, excuse me. Worse than the power outage was that house fly we had in our neighborhood earlier the same month. It was literally the size of one of our houses. You could see each individual piece of it flinching and shuddering. Thank goodness it never caused a car crash. Thank goodness it didn't crush or dent any of the roofs it landed on. And thank more than goodness that the police finally came, although that took a phone call from our mayor, and the making of that phone call took the fly landing on the side of the mayor's own garage. The police wore bulkier uniforms than we had ever seen them wear, and they brought out more equipment than we thought that they even had. The equipment let out a huge croak and blew the fly into thousands of black specks, swimming in the wind as lost as a thousand flies, and we could finally relax. We can be goofy again. I don't have anything else to say that's quite so dire. Well, that's not true. I'm gonna talk about that. Um, all right. Yeah. Let's. Uh, this is slightly lighter. Uh, it goes along the lines of what I'd like to say right now. This is a poem that I wrote on commission uh, from a good friend of mine uh, who's a cartoonist. He drew the uh, cartoon portrait of me that is currently my Facebook profile pic. Um, and he, uh, he said that he would draw that for me uh, if I wrote him a poem uh, that described the thing that it describes. I won't really give that, I won't give it away. This is a poem. This is a poem. <laughs> I don't like doing intros. And this poem has a title I don't even like. So forget it. I'm just gonna read it. <laughs> If I could recall the sound or sight of my brain 
as I chucked it out of my van and into the ditch of some median. I would repeat it for you, like a story that is longer and older than the events that it describes, lost upon all of its own subjects, lost upon the brainless wind that blows and dies beneath the earless sun. There once was a goldfish who would always swim inside of this photo album on the floor of the deep sea. What is a photo album, the children will ask. Ask them to take it apart. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take another sip of this here. And uh, then I'm gonna read two more pieces and that's gonna do it for me. Uh, they are both from my book. I do not wanna ask you to buy it. I do not want you to not buy it. <laughs> that came out passive aggressive, but the real thing that I actually wanted to say was that I hate selling things. But, <laughs> I also, <laughs> I want you to have the book, <laughs> and I need money, <laughs> and I just want you to do whatever you want to do with that information, <laughs> so whatever. <laughs> me. This is, this is another poem about how I hate things. Uh, <laughs> it's another story one, but I don't want to go back on the couch because I have a beer in my hand. Anyway. <laughs> Many people died. <laughs> Many people died in the great apple reign of 23, but those of us who survived had it even worse. First, of course, we had to learn how to travel through the apples to predict their various currents and trajectories. But the, he the helmets and the appletography training came easily enough. But from that point on, all that anybody could talk about was apples. Apples on my roof. Apples for dinner. My wife got killed by apples. Delicious apples. Horrible apples. The grief that you experience as an accomplished architect to look back and discover that the blueprint on which you have labored all year looks exactly like an apple on stilts. What could I do not to rush out of the window, throw off my armor, and welcome the sweet, heavy flood? It's a wonder that we have anything left. And it's a miracle that more of us didn't move underground, where we are safe from everything except for the bats and the potatoes. Miraculous, versatile potatoes. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. All right, so this is my last poem, and it is a poem that I wrote um, uh, for Northampton, uh, because <laughs> as some of you know and some of you don't know, and I'll say it for those of you who don't know, I, um, I lived here, or I stayed here for a summer a couple years ago, and um, the amount of kindness that I uh, have and continue to receive from this town is uh, something that I may eventually manage to repay if I live another hundred years. Uh, but in case I don't, um, this is a poem that I wrote uh, while I was sad and I lived here. I don't know, I don't know what that's worth, but um, it's the last poem I'm gonna read to you and uh, thank you again for being a great crowd. This is, in the event that you are unemployed to death, <laughs> Stovetop popcorn and hand-rolled cigarettes will gild your passage through the current economic crisis. You will disintegrate graciously into Charlie from Alaska's couch and out into the sunset over a colonial cemetery. A pelican that passes overhead may happen to inhale the smoke, but it will not experience whist or consider its own context in American history. Sugar may be sprinkled over the popcorn once the oil sizzles, 
to create the illusion of carnivals. A rose may be grabbed out of nature and handed to the prettiest individual at the carnival, or, if a rose cannot be located, one acceptable and inexpensive substitute is secretly home-popped popcorn. Unpopped kernels left untended may flee back into Charlie's cupboard, flipping their brown little wings to chew up everybody's cereal and laundry. And so, it behooves you always to leave the popcorn on the stove until each of the kernels has popped. You are also encouraged to note that rose bushes are not permissible in the cemetery and will be confiscated from the grave. Thank you very much. your socks off. We'll see you next Tuesday. All right.